सहनावतु सहन भुन सह वीर करवाहे तेजस्वीनावदी तमस्तुमाशावे ओ शाति 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 ओ भद्रम कर्णे शुणयाम देवा भद्रम पश्ये मक्षभीजत्रा स्थिरे रंग सुष्टवागम सस्तनु व्यशेम देवित यदायु ओ शाति 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 Namaskar good evening to all of you it's a great pleasure to welcome you to today's very special event in which we are releasing uh, professor dilip chakravarti's two latest books nationalism in the study of ancient indian history towards and towards a nationalist narrative of india's ancient past the i'm also very grateful to shri gurumurthy ji for agreeing to release these two uh, books shri gurumurthy needs no introduction is been addressing this gathering uh has addressed this gathering on a number of occasions and uh, benefited us with his views and thoughts on some contemporary issues for those who are new he is the chairman of the board of trustees of the vif also an independent director of the reserve bank of india editor of tamil weekly tuglak most of you know him as a thought lead, thought leader a renowned economist and a chartered accountant by profession also a media person a staunch nationalist is the author of random thoughts which the vif published uh, uh, earlier this year last year in which he presented a 360 degree critique of the present global situation and the implications for india today's uh today we have the pleasure of having shri dilip chakravarti whose books we are releasing the author he is also a renowned archaeologist and uh, for us it's a matter of uh, great honor and pride that uh, he is editing the vif's 11 volume series history of ancient india which has been uh, published or being published by iron books international and uh, sunika sare is also here uh chakravarti ji is uh, emeritus professor of south asian archaeology at cambridge university he has also taught at calcutta delhi and uh, vishwabharati universities he has uh, archaeologically surveyed the kangra valley chota nagpur plateau the whole of the ganga yamuna plain and haryana punjab area he has authored 31 books 31 books it's not a and uh, co-authored maybe a dozens of books uh, and also a few with some other authors and uh, he was honored with a padma shri in 2019 uh, for his distinct, distinguished contribution in the field of indian history and uh, archaeology 
we are very honored that uh, every year he spends uh, some time at the uh, Vivekananda International Foundation. And uh, this year also, he's been with us uh, for some time and will be here for a few months. In fact, those of you, you who wish to interact with him uh, could very well do so because uh, he is a gold mine of information. And, uh, and of course, a renowned uh, archaeologist, as I said, a field about which we know very little in uh, this country. Uh, friends, the two books that uh, we are releasing today tackle a very important uh, theme. What is the bane of history writing in contemporary India? As is becoming increasingly clear, history writing in post-independent India, dominated by left liberal colonial outlook, has deliberately ignored the nationalistic strand. And this was done for political purposes. A highly distorted version of history, colored by colonial imperatives, was presented. The continuity of the Indian civilization and cultural unity of the people of India was deliberately underplayed, despite the evidence to the contrary. A narrative was built that there was nothing of significance in India. All that India had was the outcome of the contribution of the outsiders. The influence of external factor was exaggerated at the expense of indigenous achievements. India's significant contribution towards world thought and culture was underplayed or ignored. A sense of inferiority complex amongst Indians was deliberately invoked. Voices of nationalism were suppressed. So this was the state of affairs uh, in India. I think Dr. Chakravarti, through these books and various other articles that he writes from time to time, and some of them have been published uh, on our website also, he has exposed the pernicious agenda of the left liberal ideologies which have dominated Indian history writing for a long time. There is no doubt that uh, now there is a crying need to write a history of India and the people of India from an Indian perspective without in any way distorting facts or evidence. Uh, Professor Chakravarti, as I said, has edited 11 volume uh, history of uh, ancient India series. And I was reading that, and there was some uh, uh, interesting uh, mention of uh, Swami Vivekananda. And Swami Vivekananda, speaking to a group of young men in 1891, had exhorted the Indians to write, and I quote, accurate, sympathetic, and soul searching, soul inspiring history of the land. So this feeling that the way the history was written was felt even by the Swami Vivekananda. And again, in the book, uh, uh, History of India, there was a mention of uh, Rabindranath Tagore, who, speaking in a similar vein in 1903, had blamed the Indians themselves for their lethargy and imitating others and not looking at Bharat Varsha from Bharatul Varsha's own perspective. There's a long quotation uh, in the book, which is worth uh, reading. He criticized the prevalent tendency to regard the past as, quote unquote, bankrupt time. So this feeling that whatever happened in uh, India earlier, that belonged to a bygone era, and it was era which was a bankrupt, barren. And a large number of historians in the Late century, including Bhandarkar, Altekar, K.P. Jaiswal, Mukherjee, R.K. Mukherjee, and many others, actually were acutely aware that India's history needs to be written from an Indian uh, cultural perspective. Unfortunately, this didn't happen even in independent uh, India. And these impulses, which were there in so many people, in the 19th century, in the earlier part of 20th century, 
all these impulses were grounded and snuffed out in independent India. So that is the bane of our history writing. And what is interesting is that new archaeological finds, which have been documented in uh, by uh, uh, Dilip Chakravarti ji and many others, these finds, which are pointing to a completely different uh, idea of India, they were ignored. And uh, these evidences were completely ignored or even pushed aside. Dr. Chakravarti, I had a brief look at uh, the book that he has uh, written. Dr. Chakravarti notes in his book that there were voices of dissent and dissatisfaction uh, at the prevailing state of affairs. And uh, he has brought out a very interesting uh, uh, reference to Dr. Ramano Loya and uh, uh, education, the then education minister, uh, M.C. Chagla. And I think uh, Anirban also had a little role in that. And uh, Dr. Lohia described the historiography, Indian historiography, as diseased historiography. It was in 1966 in the, on the floor of the parliament. And the then education minister, Chagla, as Mr. Chakravarti has pointed out, actually decided to set up a committee of distinguished scholars for reviewing, rewriting of Indian history from the point of view of India. But what happened to that committee, nobody knows. So that is the state of affairs. And the committee probably never took off. Instead, in the 70s, several institutions were set up, dominated by left liberal establishment, and they came out with textbooks giving a highly selective, biased, and distorted version of Indian history. So that's where we are. Dr. Chakravarti's books and articles are a great effort to not only expose the political agendas, but also to set the stage for a fresh look on writing of Indian history based on new discoveries, evidences, and insights, of which there are now plenty and they are all gathering. So we have to put it all together. So thank you very much, Sadiwati uh, Ji, for being here with us today. We're really grateful to you. And I also want to congratulate uh, Vikas Ji of Aryan Book, uh, Books International for publishing uh, books. And uh, Mr. Arya has been a steady partner of the BIF over the last several years, <coughs> bringing out the uh, 11 volumes of History of Ancient India series, and also several other books that we have uh, published. So uh, with these words now, I request uh, Sri Gurumurthy ji to uh, formally uh, release the books. <laughs> So, I now request uh, uh, Professor Dilip Chakravarti to kindly uh, give an introduction. I thank Dr. Gurumurthy Ji for kindly agreeing to release the books. I thank Dr. Gupta for kindly agreeing to select the books for release by the BIM. I thank all colleagues and friends for taking time off their schedule to be present in today's meeting. I am fully aware that their very presence is a great honor for ordinary university teachers like me. The first book, the one on nationalism in ancient India, puts enough academic facts and arguments to state that in its 250 years of history, the study of ancient India went through its worst and hopelessly debilitating phase when it was under leftist control 
between circa 1960 and circa 2015, the last date coinciding with the control of the ICHR by people like Professor Rustam Brown. The book offers in the process a factual and objective evaluation to state that there is no reason to denigrate the old nationalist historians and admire those who championed the communist cause in their place. If the study of ancient India has to go forward, the first necessary step is to neutralize the still lingering communist influence in the field. It is regrettable that the present ruling power in the country has failed to recognize that this task will require total ruthlessness and a carefully planned program. The second book <clears throat> also professionally introduces an issue of which a great many of us are totally unaware. There are two major points here. First, the integrity and the homogeneity of the Indus civilization, which, along with its literary counterpart, the Vedic tradition, <coughs> is the basic building block <coughs> of the Indian high tradition, are being increasingly questioned by a number of Western scholars and their Indian underlings, of whom there are too many in Pune, Baroda, etc., and also in institutions like the Archaeological Survey of India. To combat this, one has to know how to play the game. That is to combat all offensive moves clearly and again ruthlessly. As far as the international moves are concerned, most of the Indian archaeologists are not merely indifferent to national interests, but also frightfully weak academically. The way the Archaeological Survey of India grants permission to study to foreign archaeologists and their Indian university agents is completely uncritical. The second book incidentally highlights an essentially Indian narrative of how our ancient past developed. It also highlights the simple fact that the basic landscape of the Indus civilization zone has remained fundamentally unchanged since that day. This reinforces my long-held assumption that ancient India is a living tradition. It is not something dead. It still lives among us in innumerable ways. And the sooner we realize and establish this professionally, the better. The most serious danger which is faced by Indian archaeology at present is the unholy collaboration between a class of Western archaeologists, that is body, and their counterparts in various universities and the archaeological side of India. Actually, I have reached almost the end of my working life, but I can see how it will end. It will end in the complete elimination of the Indian role in archaeological affairs of the country. And ministry or the people concerned with it are not even aware of this. Forget the university people. The university people have never been nationalists of any kind, not at least in this country. There's no doubt about it. In fact, I was taken by surprise when Lieutenant General Sonny said in one of his lectures, the nation first with the motto of this institution. I was surprised in the sense because it was the first time I heard nation being mentioned in the precincts of an academic institution. This is true. So we have to be, I don't know how to go about it, but it is to be combated ruthlessly. There is no scope for civilization there, here. In this business to fight the leftists, this is business to fight to eliminate what has been rammed down our throat for ages. So, so this is the basic contention of these two books. There are other things as well. For instance, one of the books discusses the recent trends in the study of the Indus civilization. I suppose it does quite well, but that's a different thing. This is purely professional matter. But outside the profession, there is also a national issue involved. And the national issue is that nation faces a danger as far as Indian archaeology is concerned. And the sooner we are aware of it, and the sooner we take steps to prevent it, the better. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, uh, Professor Chakravarti. Now, I request uh, Guru Murthy ji to kindly deliver the keynote address.
Thank you, Dr. Gupta. And uh, my respects to Dilip Chakravarti ji for uh, a kind of commitment which we don't see in most academic uh, professionals today. It's not 31 books which are important because people write books. But to write about the truth which you believe in spite of the fact that it may not be very popular in the ocean of falsehoods which are circulating is important. Because we are living in Kaliuga, the dark age, in which you have to really search for truth, both to speak as well as to hear. So when we are talking about history and Indian history, you know, I am not a historian, but I am interested in history. I am not an economist, but I am interested in economy. But it is your interest which makes you search for truth. Scholarship does not guarantee truth. It's actually your interest. The longing to find the truth is more important than the scholarship you have over the kind of uh, literature, whether it is spiritual, whether it is uh, historical. So as someone who has been in greatly interested in literature, I mean, historic literature. I would like to share my thoughts as an Indian, as an Indian who views India as a country which has not only had a great past, but which has struggled to, to maintain a certain value system, which the world will need tomorrow. And by holding on to the value system, it has emerged as some kind of a, a pole towards which some many countries are looking at India today. It's not because of politics. It's not because of uh, the institutional strength of India. We don't have Harvard University. We don't have a Stanford University. We don't have a Ford Foundation or Carnegie. We have great individuals who have sustained it. Arun Shuri always used to tell me, Guru, it is not the institutional strength of India which has sustained us for a millennium. It is the strength of individuals. So it is individuals who have sustained India. So you, I would like to break down the understanding of Indian history in simple points, not going to very complex things. First is, that the Indian history needs to be rewritten. And as written, it is wrong. It is almost universally accepted by all people other than those who have written the history. It is only those who have written the history who think that it should not be touched. If somebody says it should be rewritten, no, 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 they want to rewrite the whole thing. It's all suffranization. But the immediately abuse starts. Once there is abuse, even people who are very keen academicians, who are intellectually sound, they do not want to get into a street quarrel. So what they do, they withdraw. Every time there has been an attempt to relook at Indian history, I don't even want an Indian perspective. I want an Indian experience. Indian perspective may still be a question, what is Indian perspective? But what is Indian experience? What has been Indian attitude? What has sustained a kind of a model which if you keep India on the one side and the rest of the world on the other, there is more diversity here than the rest of the world put together, sustainable. How it has sustained itself? So these are all the questions which come to my mind. And that Indian history needs to be rewritten has been the thought of both the ruling party and the opposition party in 1950s and 60s. Of course, Dr. Dilip Chakravarti has brought it out, but I would like to still quote a couple of sentences from 
Chakla made a, a long statement. This is 1966. And Chakla was intellectually one of the soundest persons to have been in politics. And in those days, we never used to look at which community a man belonged. What he was was more important than which community he belonged. We never accepted Chakla because he belonged to a minority. That was not our understanding of India. That all came much later. Political uh, attitudes polarized the nation into uh, seeing a person only through his color, only through his language, only through his religion, only through what his identity is, irrespective of what his views are. Now, see what Chakla says. This he tells the parliament. Now I shall tell you what we are doing, the government, 1966. That is to the that is more to the point. We have set up a board of distinguished people who are rewriting the Indian history from the point of view of India. You know when it stopped? It stopped when Professor Nurul Hassan took over as the education minister and set up institutions to completely destroy what Chagla said. This turn happened. It is not that it is that the Indian leaders did not think of producing a historic, historical account of India. From the Indian perspective, Indian point of view, Indian experience. But this was scuttled by politics. What happened by the breakup of the Congress in 1969, which is one of the greatest and saddest events in the history of India, done by one person for her own lust for power. In fact, Ramnath Goenka, with whom I was very closely associated, he told me a personal experience which is worth sharing because this is a historic turn which brought about the turn about the Indian historical studies also. He told me he had a meeting with Mrs. Gandhi. In fact, he was supposed to have been the person who uh, brought Kamaraj from Chennai when Lal Babu Shastri died by arranging a flight. And for a long time, Mr. Muraji Desai thought that uh, Ramnath Goenka had really helped uh, Mrs. Gandhi to become the Prime Minister. In fact, he said, because I arranged the flight as Kamaraj requested, I had to bear the blame of being the person responsible for the choice of Mrs. Gandhi, with which he had nothing to do. But Mrs. Gandhi owed a sense of gratitude to him because he had arranged the flight for Kamaraj to come here. These are all off the record thing. Of course, it has come out in some interview or the other. When he met her in 1969 and told her that you are breaking the Congress, which amounts to breaking India. And where are you doing it? She asked Mr. Goenka, are you my friend or my enemy? Then the man got up and said, the choice is yours. And that's how the battle between them started. Why I am saying this is, it is the fight which started, political fight, personal fight, which were turned into ideological fights and which became divisive of the country and fragmented the country into this and that and the other. It all started in 1969. And I think I, I, I am entitled to request Dr. Chakravarti to integrate this political change which took place in India as the turning point in Chagla's agenda not being pursued. And earlier, a person who could never be identified with uh, the Hindu or Hindutva ideology, a socialist, a rebel, Lohia, he raised three valid questions. And I'm very gr grateful to Dr. Chakravarti that he has listed them. The real question is to what extent India's history really rotten and how far has historical writing aggravated this rottenness. 
what are the possibilities it is possible that the indian people have been specially prone to the vice of foreign subjugation two it is possible that historiography in this country has been turned in turned this vice into a virtue and has got successive generations to confuse enslavement with synthesis you see how beautifully he puts turning enslavement into synthesis surface changes with the renaissance disintegration with the diversity these are all not statements of persons who can anyway be associated with a person with an agenda a religious or other agenda it is possible that indian history writing has further sinned in looking for synthesis where it does not exist for foreign inspiration and even influx all over the place you know these are all very important things to look back as to why our history stands where it is because most of the distortions of indian history took place after by indians took place after 1969 previously others distorted our history they are entitled to distort it we were enslaved they could write our history they could justify why they had to enslavers you are fit only to be enslaved and we are here to rule over you and there was an agenda and they had a justification political justification they had a historical role to play to civilize india and so that they could produce literature which we need not accept that is why we started doing maybe a bit late in 1966 as chagla said but it was cutting and the entire distortion of indian historical writings took place not by scholars but government run institutions which has been beautifully brought out by uh, dr chakravarty see you look at the content of history in the world this is from a normal man's perspective an inquiring man's perspective which even historians must consider according to me ancient and modern history of the world and particularly the west has been the history of state wars violence victory written by the victors this is the history of the world and they say india lacks sense of history it is not that we lack sense of history we actually lack violence we actually lack wars where they were prone to wars we were prone to avoiding wars this is what i'm going to say and this is proven what i am saying is proven in this country philosophically and practically where you look at the entire course of war in fact uh, al basham deals with this in the context of uh, indian uh, attitude to wars and who india waged wars in india there was another way of looking at state craft war kings their role how they should deal with other kings there was a paradigm difference ancient india has no tales to tell of the violence of the kind that took place elsewhere in the world which became the subject of historical studies and investigation this i am not saying this yale basham says no country in the world had such a noble warfare can you align nobility and warfare it was not only aligned it was practiced in india a king under our dharma shastras cannot wage a war simply because he has a large army he is supposed to give notice to other people that i i have a large army i have competence i have advisors i want to rule over the entire bharatvarsha and i want to become the chakravarti and i will hold one ashwamedha yagna and i am giving invitation to all of you whosoever attends my yagna i have accepted i am the leader and i will send a platoon of army 
and anyone who stops the army wants to have a war with you one year this process will go on anyone who stops the pritu wants to have a war with me and i will have a war with him and if i defeat him also i will hand over the kingdom back to him this is called dharma vijaya this has been extensively practiced in india this has been documented by uh, bandarkar institute in the uh, dharma shastras volumes instance by instance not only in the north not only in the east not only in the west but also in the south pallava kings have practiced it so we had a rule to avoid war and he, even in the wars what kind of rules you must have the man on the horse should not fight a man on the ground the man who is fully armed should not fight a person who is not armed just having a weapon in his hand a man who dropped the weapon he is no more a soldier a wounded person is a wounded person wounded soldier is a wounded person elaborate rules of war this meant there was no violence in india that there was no violence in india is not something which is a research done by indians it was a research done by professor r j ramal of hawaii university who has built a monumental website power kills in which he has documented 2500 years of manslaughter by human beings by institutions by kings by ideologies and he has estimated that something like 680 million to 1.2 billion people have been killed in the world in the last 2500 years and you must see his home page he says till the 13th century killing nil in india how will you have history unless there is violence and killing it is not that indians lack a sense of history indians lacked the will to kill the will to kill results in history so it is not that the indians lacked a sense of history we have to look at the drives of history and the absence of it in india to understand why history was not written in fact my mind goes back to uh, the days when i was very actively involved in managing newspaper you know we were thirsting for news you know what is news news is when an accident takes place it is news when an accident is avoided it is not news in fact one uh, railway uh, chap boat chairman once told me there was an accident and we had published it in indian express in a big way and human error and things like that then he called me sir can i come and meet you i said yes then he said sir this year we have avoided 457 accidents <laughs> did you publish any news <laughs> this one news you have put it in the front page you have just destroyed the image of the indian railways i was shaken it's true he has avoided 457 accidents which we don't recognize but that one accident is news because we recognize only wrong things as news the right things happening is no news the country is peaceful today will anyone carry a news <laughs> the newspaper will not publish that day. so history is a record of planned accidents so we don't have that planned accident it's a fact we must understand historians must understand intellectuals must understand foreigners who want to understand must understand india in that sense we must quote them by their own record their own researches gentlemen we don't have any violence to report and that is why we didn't have history we have a history a method a philosophy of avoiding wars you know there was a book written by hindu rules of war by v r ramachandra dikshit which is the finest uh, seminal work on indian war model he said ashoka's kalinga war was adharmic war because the man waged the war 
because he had a large army he crushed a small kingdom and he did not go to no give notice to the other person even to accept his leadership is he a man this is the assessment about the war which we celebrate today about the king whom we celebrate today it is out of guilt ashoka turned into a pacifist of course he was a pacifist only in the sense of conquest not in the sense of ruling he has used the army to crush rebellions against him as a king he had a responsibility of doing it because he has to maintain law and order ashoka is not buddha we have projected him as buddha but the fact is ashoka was also a very violent ruler violent conqueror which was condemned by scholarship actually the rules of war in india would have undergone a change we would have produced history had we followed chanakya you know chanakya came in contact with alexander in takshashila university in fact i was surprised to find it was in the pakistan government website this interface between alexander and chanakya kautilya has been quoted chanakya challenged alexander that our war model is this that we don't go and crush people like that we have a dialogue with them first and then only have a war that you have come from such a place you have been pillaging people across and you are doing this what kind of ruler you are then he orders his arrest and then chanakya escapes this is the account that is given in the pakistan government website now you can't access it but i have downloaded and kept it for some writing the important point is when chanakya saw that this is the warfare elsewhere he decided that we must also have a matching warfare model then he said we must have a regular army and then he said this dharma vijaya concept that you acquire and give the land back to the defeated person will not work you have to build an empire and so he brought elaborate rules of war as part of the arthashastra you know arthashastra disappeared all over the country dilip chakravarti ji please give some response to my question arthashastra disappeared all over the country this was a literature of the second third century bc this disappeared you know why panapatta wrote a critique on kautilya he is an adharmi he is a rascal he is promoting adharma arthashastra books were dispensed with all over the country only one copy escaped and was found in tanjur library and tanjur maharaja donated it to mysore maharaja he put it in his library this was discovered in 1907 translated in 1915 that is how we got arthashastra the history of arthashastra will prove why india or the indian civilization was defeated if only chanakya's rules had been followed subsequently we had such a peaceful time it has been explained beautifully in this book we had an exceptionally peace time till 1750 let's say till 7750 no one nobody should challenge us we became lethargic he said chanakya was a rascal we are living so peacefully that is why banabatta was able to challenge chanakya's views because the country was so peaceful and this man is advocating maintain a large army and you must conquer you must rule a deceptive peace period lull india into inaction that later you know what happened and we never developed the strategic mindset of chanakya subsequently with the result 
between the 11th century and 15th 16th century you know what happened in this country till chatrapati shivaji came on the scene and changed the war model completely if you are semi barbaric i will also be semi barbaric this rule was justified by krishna in the mahabharata war when he told arjuna kill this man even if he is disarmed because he has no he doesn't deserve the rule of dharma because he has violated it you see this kind of approach was never there this was reinstated by shivaji so in this period india had a, such a peaceful time it never felt there was a need for news there was in fact if a newspaper had been functioning between uh, ashoka's period until 750 ad it could not have published there was nothing to publish so the indian history writing cannot be based on the rules or the models or the instances of the western world it has to be based on positive then how can people live in peace how could they live in peace how such a diverse people speaking different languages worshiping thousands and thousands of gods could live in peace this should be the investigation of the history in india and that will take you to tarka shastra nothing was decided in the street everything was decided by the scholars their discussions purva paksha you have to study the other person's views to criticize the view points of that person and put your view point you see elaborate rules as to how to avoid street quarrels elaborate rules as to how to avoid war elaborate rules as to how to have noble warfare you know we heard in the mahabharata that uh, after the war was over you have killed everybody you have killed their brother you have killed their sister sister's husband but the pandavas and kauravas had a drink at the night you know this is what we heard in the mahabharata right everybody thought you know this is mythology i want you to read history of kerala by padmanabha menon padmanabha menon quotes white way on the fight between on the wars between the portuguese and the zamuri kings in that two instances come out how the zamuri kings said wars you know they used to have they, they used to have from uh, next month uh, 15th onwards we will have war these were the two kings we decide and the war is you no know, we will keep the war in the open playground there is a lake on this side there is a lake on the other side you can perch your army there i can we can perch our army here and the it goes on to say the warriors will even share uh, uh, meals and shake hands with each other at the beat of the drum they will separate into warring groups and fight each other what mahabharata told us which we consider as mythology was practiced in kerala by the zamuri kings and of course the white way says it is the brahmins who brought this noble warfare from the north to the south no it prevailed everywhere in that sense it is not brought from one place to the other nobody will be infected with good things good things have to generate from within it is bad things can be imported and exported good things will never be this is the work done by great spiritual masters it was not the rule of the kings that is why kings did not have prominence in india they did not have the determinative role state did not have the determinative role the functions were very widely shared you know when the british came here what was the biggest problem they faced they could not acquire land because the state could not acquire land according to the dharma shastras in india there is a talk about the rajan raja raja chola was a hindu or not he wanted to build this huge big temple he could not acquire land he had to call all the village head people and buy the land there is no power of compulsory acquisition 
you cannot take over the land of the people against the wishes of the people and the panchayat so when the land acquisition act was passed this was cited as the reason the principle of eminent domain which lawyers will know what eminent domain is eminent domain is not only your property belongs to you your life also belongs to the king that is why nirende argued during the emergency it is on the principle of eminent domain our constitution functions eminent domain is a product of the greek or roman model of jurisprudence where your property doesn't belong to you your life also doesn't belong to you everything is granted from the state to you the state can suspend it is suspended millards if somebody shoots yes police inspector shoots somebody your lordship sir helpless except to look at it you can't do anything because that is the law on which you function this was never indian law so there is a paradigm difference a different philosophy a different lifestyle different relationships this is what this we must capture the world must know this and this was a functioning reality it is not something imagined whether mahabharata this thing happened or not you can see in white ways writing and the zamari king writes to the portuguese sir we have this model this is how we do the model morning after the sunrise we will beat the drum say we are ready for war but we will not attack you till you beat the drum and uh, we will have in the open playground people should not be affected agricultural operation should not be affected education institution should not be affected and you know another thing also we suggest why we allow 10000 from your side and 10000 from our side to eat each other you select 50 of your best fighters we will select 50 of our best fighters let them fight we will all look at it if one side loses maybe the other side at that point can compromise otherwise you know if that is not sufficient you send 100 of your next big fighters then the coach is are saying is he asking for war or sports this is the indian history this is what we should be writing till 1899 in the west there was no distinction between combatants and non combatants in war except that uh, some christian priests brought about peace you should not kill a fellow christian that is also a religious grant it's not a human grant it's not a grant based on human sentiments you know when this is the paradigm how india avoided war should be the model for world that's your history this has been beautifully brought out in bandarkar institute study instance by instance this has been there in the 8th century 9th century 11th century 14th century 17th century in kerala this is indian history indian history is not a history of war and violence indian history is history of how we avoided it how we curbed the propensity of egoistic people violent people conquerors bigots but this is not what the history of the world is it is not founded on they don't even know about it now this is one aspect the history the other aspect is nationalist narrative of indian past you see we must understand what is nation sir the idea of nation till the 18th century the nation states did not exist in fact it is no more or less admitted 17th and 18th century were the time when the idea of nation states got defined till then the idea of nation state was not there nation was never there you know very recently a nationalism project has been started and now sense of nation had nothing to it was only power for example when when france was carved out maybe less than 2 or 3% of the people would have known the french language 
maybe that many people would have only known the italian language these are all states which were carved out on linguistic basis these are all beautifully brought out by arun suri in his book these are all not known it is our historians who are supposed to tell this our historians duty is not to tell about how wrong things were in the west it is their duty to tell how wrong we are how wrong we have been so the idea of nation i am surprised to find dilip ji this i had a discussion with a great scholar because he is not familiar with this discourse in vedas there are three shabdas which come one is rashtra second is desha third is jana i told him i keep hearing this what is rashtra what is desha and what is jana he himself had not studied it he said give me 15 days time and he has sent me a note which i will forward to you in that he says the relation between the jana and desha is rashtra and when there is a conflict between jana and rashtra there is a conflict between the interest of jana and rashtra the interest of jana will have to yield to the interest of rashtra is what is specified in rigveda i was stunned i have that with me so rashtra is a concept which the world never knew and even now he is finding it difficult to grasp which is there in vedas and the relationship between desha rashtra and jana is dealt with we didn't know how big that rashtra was that is defined by the puranas puranas may or may not have happened it may have been a worthless story but it was written at a particular time that cannot be denied whether mahabharata happened ramayana happened it is irrelevant whether rama was there irrelevant according but ramayana was written is relevant but in ramayana the tribes mentioned in ramayana are there even today that means these tribes were there even at that time there are hundreds of tribes whose names are mentioned in mahabharata who are there today this is written 2000 years back that means these tribes were there at that time which means these tribes the so called tribes and we have a common history it is not that they were outcast they were thrown out they were kept out this is colonial approach the entire tribal history today is totally totally based on western anthropology and western attitude to try first they said savage then they said barbaric then they said semi barbaric then they said tribe they found as more and more and more people were coming into the mainstream they said indigenous people and finally the united nations document says the indigenous people concept will not apply to india because the indigenous people are ruling india in other places indigenous people have been driven out or destroyed it doesn't apply to asia and africa it is conceded by the united nations document on indigenous people itself because we are all indigenous people that how this problem of plains and and our uh, so called tribals uh, that arose it is because the british carved out the forest areas and never allowed the forest people to come in and never allowed the plains people to go to forest they divided us otherwise forest was a place of contemplation for us you know upanishads are called aranyakas they are book of forest the ritual books are called brahmanas it is the aranyakas which develop the contemplative power that is why people go to forest that is why you have vanaprastha 
These are all ideas that you have to go to forest, you have to live with nature. And that has been recognized by IG and CA in their literature in 2007. I was surprised to find that the explanation which I am giving you is in the document of the IG and CA that the forest is not backward, it is a place of enlightenment. Forest people are not backward. And in the first Deber Committee report, which is a very, very critical document which has been put on the website of the Culture Ministry now, which was not available earlier, it says the mobility between forests and plains were so often taking place. You cannot say in India who belongs to the plain and who belongs to the forest. This was the position till the British came. The Beel tribes are waging war. The kings will ask them, come and wage wars for us. They were Talabadis. They were uh, war heads. So why I am saying this is, this entire thing is uninvestigated, ununderstood. And we have imposed to the paradigm of people whose lifestyle was different, whose attitudes were different, whose Ideologies are different, whose purposes are different, whose goals are different. And you are playing football with cricket rules. So it's a very major area of concern for us. And now I'll tell you what the Puranas say. What the Vedas said as Rashtra, Vesha, Jana, I don't know because it's a, these are all relationship between man, land, and the idea of Rashtra. You take any Purana. All Puranas define what is Bharata Varsha. These Puranas are dated varyingly between uh, 2000 years before and maybe 700, 800. It's about in a thousand year period, the, the, the Puranas are there. Any, any Purana you take. It says in the north it is Himalayas, in the south it is the seas, in the west it is the Evanas, in the east it is Kiradas. The people who reside in this area are called Bharatiyas. Tell me, any country in the world has this kind of definition at that time? Bharatiyas, they believe in karma and rebirth. And one more, not only they believe in karma and rebirth, they are very mysterious people. And we are mysterious even today. Couldn't understand. Anyone who comes from outside to India, he will find the color different, he will find the sizes different, he will find the language different, he will find the food different. He will find everything different, but everything is one. This question was put to Mahatma Gandhi. You know, the history of India was perverted in 1940 and was destroyed in 1960. Then Mahatma Gandhi came, came to India. Before he came to India, he wrote a literature. And the literature is Hind Swaraj. It is a dialogue which Mahatma Gandhi had with himself. And he wrote this in the travel between Cape Town and London in a ship. And he wrote it in Gujarati. Then he's right, 18 hours or 20 hours he wrote at, at a stretch. Then his right hand paint, he wrote it, or wrote it with the left hand. It is a dialogue between an imaginary editor and an imaginary reader. The reader puts the question, all the questions that were in the mind of the Indians, Indian intellectuals. One of the questions is, how do you say India is one nation? It's only post offices and railways which made you into one nation. How do you call yourself one nation? This is what the reader asks. The editor replies, you see, you must understand one thing. Our forefathers were great people. They knew God could be worshipped at home and even within yourself. But they set up these four dams. They gave sacredness to all the rivers and distinct places and made us travel from one end of the country to the other. Millions of people traveled without knowing each other's language and they were treated well and they were one. And we had the sense of Ganga united us. 
and he said we were one in the sense in which no two Englishmen can be. This was the unity of India. This is the historic unity of India. And this book was banned. This ban was not lifted till 1938. In 19, 1938, the British lifted the ban because it was such a violent critique of the Western civilization. They could not bear to see this circul being in circulation. In 1940, Mahatma Gandhi wrote, I again read this. I don't need to change a comma or full stop. In 1935, Jawaharlal Nehru wrote the Glimpses of World History in the teacher page 820. He says, there is very little distinction between Indian nationalism and Hindu nationalism because India is the only country of Hindus. And he goes one step further. He says, Swami Vekananda very powerfully articulated the concept of Hindu nationalism. It is not against anybody. And Jawaharlal Nehru accepted in 1935 Vivekananda's concept of Hindu nationalism. In 1939, Rajini Palme Dutt, he wrote a book, India Today. And he was the man, Rajini Palme Dutt belonged to India. He organized the Communist Party in England. He was the founder of the Communist Party. At that time, one of the arguments the British were giving is that after all, we set up education institutions, you learnt English, then you learnt about the three worlds. That is how you got the spirit of freedom. This was how the British were trying to ridicule the freedom movement. The freedom movement itself is a product of their conquest. Rajini Palmedat wrote a critique against it. Beautiful critique. In fact, this should be printed and distributed free to all the communists of India. He said, even if you guys had not set up any education institution or taught us English, the isolated Veda Padashala somewhere would have given us from the Vedas and Upanishads the spirit of freedom. This was India in 1939. Everything changed on the day in 1940 when Muhammad Ali Jinnah passed the resolution for creation of Pakistan. Every leader gave up the word Hindu from that day. Hindus became orphaned in India because Jinnah passed the resolution for creation of Pakistan. And if you talk about Hindu, then you are accepting what Jinnah says. Afterwards, nobody spoke about Hindu. And Jawaharlal Nehru came later to say, there is no national communalism in India except Hindu communalism. And he went one step further. Muslim communalism is aggressive, but Hindu communalism is dangerous. I mean, see the way the whole national mind has been disturbed and distorted. And history is caught in this cleft. So we have to rescue all this. We have to put out these facts. And it requires intellectual guts, courage, capacity to face abuse. We have, we have grown with hearing abuses. So history writing in India will have to be based on the Indian approach to whole life. The approach of Indian states, the role of army, the attitude to the other king. You know, it's a total difference. El Basham says, there has never been an instance of the kind which we have witnessed in Western countries of human body being kept and exhibited. Indian warfare is one of the noblest. If you have a noble warfare, if you have an accident-free railway, there will be no news, there will be no history. So unless we write the history of peace, you cannot write the history of India. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that stimulating talk.
And uh, there was one request to Professor Chikravarti to respond to one of his questions, whether we would like to do that. I've got one problem. Gurumurthy Ji's knowledge of Indian texts is formidable. Unfortunately, that is my weakest point. But I can tell you something about what a British historian wrote about Peshwa's, Maratha Peshwa's approach to war. Tipu Sultan used to cut the noses of the defeated soldiers or the soldiers of the defeated army. Whereas the Peshwa's used to feed them and give them two rupees so that they could go back home and begin cultivation again. This is certainly a very useful point to pursue, but it will need years of research on different kinds of Indian texts. Ashoka's Kalinga War, I don't know whether it is Adharmic or not, but for him, it was a very necessary war. In the sense, the location of Kalinga was such that because if he had to expand in the south, he had to take possession of Kalinga, which is basically southwest India, it's part of Andhra and Orisha. So he had to do that. I think, I beg to disagree with Gurumurthiji here. Um, there must be occasions when the kings fought for geopolitical interests. But again, there is a code. In James Todd, an authentic of Rajasthan, there is an incident. You see, the king of Mewar was fighting one of his enemies, was the king of Jalawar. Now, unfortunately, that man was also the Mewar king's uncle. So after the day's fight was over, they two at dinner together. And the Mewar king said, uncle, we shall begin our fight tomorrow quite early so that we can finish it that day. But finishing that war will mean one of them will be dead. It's as straight as that. But it's deeply touching that it could continue right up to when it was taught there. Right up to the 18th century, certainly towards the close of the 18th century. That attitude was there. So what Guru Murtiji has said about Indian wars, that has set me thinking. I shall look for more examples of that kind. But again, it is said that Indian texts are not my strong point. 